welcome my friend, Pastor Benson Omondi. Uh, he is somebody that I have known for a number of years. We came to know one another while I was serving a scripture union in Harlingham, and he was working for Christian Medical Fellowship, and they were tenants uh, at the scripture union house, and we were close. They were paying rent, so, <laughs> so we were good friends. If he wasn't paying rent, maybe <laughs> he would not have come today. But at the moment, he is the team leader and the CEO of Africa Enterprise. Uh, some of you know it as Africa Evangelistic Enterprise. Uh, it's just here near World Vision. Uh, that's where their offices are. And we felt that um, these are people in the missions. And he is also a missions pastor with ICC. Uh, we thought that it would go be good for him to come and share with us this morning. So I want to welcome him. He has come with his family. He's going to introduce them uh, and as he shares the word. Let's pray for him. Father, in the name of Jesus, we do want to thank you that you are the one who gives us opportunity to share your word. And this morning, you have seen it fit for Pastor Benson Omondi to share with us your word as a congregation. We pray that you may lead him to say the right thing and the things that will inspire us into doing the things that you want us to do in the mission field. Bless his time and use him as your vessel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Welcome. You have your... There we have it. Praise the Lord and good morning. I want to very quickly introduce my family. I would want to ask them to stand. Um, that's my wife, Janet Mukamia Wino, and that's uh, Emmanuel Tello. Emmanuel turned seven this year. Okay, and that's uh, Anita Kue Owino. Anita turned 11 also this year. So that's my family. And they were gracious to accompany me. From time to time, if you are within the country and we have the resources, we believe that uh, we are supposed to expose them to the word of God. And as they see us share the word, then perhaps by the grace of God, God is able to drop something in one of them. Could be an engineer, but an engineer who knows God. A doctor, but a doctor who is able to, to, to share the gospel at the side of the bed. And that's our prayer for each one of us each day that the Lord gives us a chance to, to share the word of God. Now, very quickly, I also want to introduce African Enterprise because as we share the word again, it's important that we know from what platform do you operate from. Um, African Enterprise, uh, in, in East African region, we are known as African Evangelistic Enterprise. And sometimes people question whether we are in business. Yes, we are in business, but the business of the gospel. And so, but beyond Africa um, and uh, in certain regions like South Africa, Ethiopia, uh, now we are getting entry into South Sudan and, uh, and the West Africa, then there we are known as African enterprise. Even North Africa, Tunis and a bit of Morocco, our intention is as we go there, then we go in as businessmen. But then quietly we know that we are able then to share the gospel. So we are domiciled in 10 African nations. I wouldn't want to go into that because of the time uh, that have been given. What is our mission? As African enterprise, our mission is to evangelize the cities of Africa, and not the cities. The cities of Africa through word and deed, but we do that in partnership with the church. And when we mean, we say the church is the, the ecclesia, the, the body of Christ. So we, we don't partner with one church. And you'll begin to understand why, as maybe from time to time I share some of the examples. And also each nation, each team, each national team, I lead the Kenyan team. But each national team each year has been mandated to do what we call a citywide evangelism. So we don't, we don't do a door-to-door -door and a crusade in a small place, no. If we target Mombasa, it's the wider Mombasa. 
if we target Nairobi, it's the, the entire Nairobi. Uh, and I will be giving you numbers just to give you a feel. Uh, when we say city, it's city the way we define it. Uh, so long as it has a population of 250,000 people, then that for us as African enterprise is a city. So, so, so Meru is a city for us. Malindi is a city. Mombasa is a city. Obviously, Nairobi is a mega city. So all those cities qualify. Kitale is a city. Kakamega is a city. So those are cities that we go into. And you see a lot of that also being uh, described in the Bible. So the city word evangelism is, is a mandate of the team leader to work with the, the body of Christ in that city to then deliver each year uh, evangelism in the entire city. The model that we use, and I'm sure uh, the person doing for us the PowerPoint is, is helping us, we use what we call stratified evangelism, which basically means if, if you split the earth into two you, you, and you look at it from across, you will see it is split into different strata. There is the humus, there is the, 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 the topsoil, the subsoil, you go to gravel, and you know, as you go until you come across the rock. So we, we believe that if you go into any city, that city is stratified. There are people who live in Kayole, not because they don't want to live in Karen, but because of the resources they have, they're only able to afford where? Kayole. So, but you, when you take the gospel to the people in, 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 in Kayole, the same, same gospel cannot be taken to the people who are in Karen. So we tailor make the gospel that fits that person because there are places where you have busy bodies. People are relaxed, you call a crusade, they will come. But they are busy professionals whom you may not even get like the manager of Tuskies. You can only catch him for those 30 minutes in the morning and they're able to receive the word. So the gospel that you take to them is different from the crusade and from the door to door and so on and so forth. So we call it what? Stratified evangelism. Now the beauty of that stratified evangelism is that if I evangelize the busy professional, the governor, the MCA, I am able to follow them up within that strata. If I do evangelism in Kibera, I'm able to follow them. And again, the model of following them in those small groups is very different. So it's an effective AE uh, model that has been uh, very effective across the cities and many other countries are now embracing uh, that. So I want to very quickly go then to the, the, the mission emphasis. The reason why we are here today is to just be able to see over this KCC uh, mission emphasis. What do we want to see happen? Uh, the, my, my wife from time to time before I come to share asks me, so, so what do you have in store for us? Because she's part of the congregation. And, and I tell her, I have two objectives. And I was telling her when we were still in the car. Two objectives. If, if I accomplish that, then for me, this gospel would have been accomplished. Two objectives. Number one, it is my prayer that God will enable us through this beautiful topic that we have, open doors, to identify those doors. Because those doors are not closed. They are open. But number two, there is one thing for the door to be open, but it's another to enter into those doors. So one of my prayers is that, Lord, even if it is just one person in this congregation, that you will quicken, revitalize, and, and bring them to the place where they say, I want to respond to this great commission. Then again, my mission will have been accomplished in this service and hopefully in the second service. Now, the driving force for any missioner, for any believer, is in missions and uh, as outlined in, in Matthew chapter number 28. Verse number 18 to 20. And Jesus made this statement very clearly. And the statements of a dying man, all of us know, is very important. Because that's the time you might discover that there is an account that you never knew existed. And suddenly it, it becomes the thing that will strengthen you for the next years, isn't it? So whatever, they, if they call you, my son, come. You'd better go. Because you, whatever you will say is very critical. That is when you will discover that kuna mama yako mwingine paali ujawai jua. They are now going to meet their maker. 
So they want to open up. They will tell you that in that city where you thought we never have even a land, there is a plot somewhere. So suddenly things begin to come out. And this was the case with Jesus Christ. The man is going to heaven. He calls them and tells them, all power in heaven and on earth has now been given to me. But then he very quickly says, you must go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then he says, teaching them to do what? To obey. So obedience is taught. <laughs> there is nothing that you cannot be taught. So perhaps somebody is looking at me and saying, okay, maybe the professor is wondering, this young man, what can he teach us? Anything can be taught. Even prayer, Jesus Christ was accosted by the disciples. And what were they saying? Teach us how to pray the way we've seen John doing what? Teaching the disciples. So you can be taught even how to pray effectively. You, you are a, a, a missionary. You are going to Lamu. Yes, that's okay. But you can also be taught how you can become effective where? In Lamu. So he says, teaching them to obey. And then he gives them what we call the great promise within the great commission. He tells them that I will be with you until the end of what? Ages. Now, you see now, when, when you make those kind of statements, you have armed this man. First of all, you've clearly given them the vision. Then the second thing you are telling them, clearly this is what you are supposed to do. Make disciples. Not just preach. Because you can preach and they go. But replicate yourself. Let it be that if you are a mature Christian, then you can reproduce another mature Christian. And so in our stratified evangelism, when we go out there, we are not ready to evangelize until we think very clearly the discipleship process. How will we preserve those souls? How will we, if we got 600, can we go back six months down the line and be able to say we have those 600, they are growing in the knowledge of God? Because he says, make what? Disciples. Somebody who is like you. Somebody who has the passion like you. Somebody will be able to share the gospel the way you are sharing it. Then in that case, you have made disciples. Guess what? Jesus focused only on how many? Twelve. And this is the beauty of current community church. The, the hula baloo of the numbers, sometimes it's numbers that is not deep. And so when you come together like this and you're able, you know, I like it's long ever since I went into a church and somebody is mentioning even names of people. It's beautiful, isn't it? We, 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 we are sucked into these numbers. I was in Nigeria at the beginning of this year. And you know, when I was, I was getting in awe of this 7,000 seater church, somebody told me, no, there are churches, that is a minor church. There are cities here that have what we call mega churches that is found in, 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 in three kilometer radius. That's a church. And you know, my concern and the cry of my heart, Lord, is that are you able to disciple them into small groups? Is there fellowship? Are people being family the way they are supposed to be? So the great commission for every believer is not just for the apostles and the pastors. And the command is to all believers as exemplified by Christ himself. And you see that in, uh, in Luke chapter number 9, when Jesus sends the 12 apostles, so the pastors, the evangelists, the people that sometimes we think these are the evangelists, maybe the missions department. But then when you think he leaves it there, when you go to chapter number 9 of Luke chapter 10, you find now he sends the 72, who are nameless. Now that excites me because I can place myself there, isn't it? So it means then this great commission is for all of us. You have not been saved to receive the gospel and enjoy the presence of the Holy You have been saved to go to do what? To also share the gospel. So you find, and I don't want to go into that, it can take another whole day. The 72 are sent out with very clear instructions what they are supposed to do. He even explains to them the environment. He tells them, you are going in, not in a cozy place. You may not sleep in the same bed you normally sleep. But wherever you go, if you find a man of peace, enter into that home. That place is where you will dwell. For that period, you are in the mission field. And the explanation is, I am sending you like sheep among the wolves. Now, that's scary, isn't it? 
He's telling you, the environment I'm sending you into is not cozy. It's not the, 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 the current nice environment. Huh? He's preparing you to, to get certain opposition. So that when the opposition come, then you remember. Ah, the man told us before he went to be with the Lord. Isn't it? Now, that sounds very good. But let me give you some statistics that then worry us as mission agencies. The man called Michael Parrott that did some quick statistic analysis. And he came across something that is depressing. And perhaps some of you have interacted with these numbers. That 90% of all Christians have never won a soul to the Lord. If I begin counting one, two, three, four, when I hit ten, out of those ten, only one has led one person to what? To the Lord. But 80% of all the Christians do not consistently witness to the Lord. So what are these Christians doing? They might be making money, isn't it? Perhaps some of them send that to the mission field. Now that is beautiful because I've seen that now in current community church. So I've seen the numbers. You don't pluck three million from the trees, isn't it? Yeah, it means that people are participating. 71% do not give towards the financing of the Great Commission. But the Great Commission is expensive. And you will see why. 81% is estimated of non-Christians. They've never seen a Christian. And this is the, the state of world review by, by Operation World. 2016. Maybe the number has gone up or has gone down. I do not know. Now, the interesting thing about our country, we say we are 83% what? Christians. Can you relate that with the corruption status in this country? No. So you keep on wondering. So is this, tw- uh, that should be uh, 83 minus 100% how many? 17. Our 17, they want to harass how many? Because 83% are Christians, isn't it? So these 17s are dangerous people. We need to remove them from this country. So, and you see, that is not the truth because somebody else did another statistics. And this was a statistic that was released by the, 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 the body of Christ. And this is what they discovered. So that then you know the reality check that actually it's not the, 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 the 17%. This African Center for Missions finished the task many years back, and perhaps Scripture Union during your time must have participated in this, that in Nairobi, we have only 16% Christians, whom you can call Christians and saved. Now, that explains why you are parking today as you left, the vehicles are intact. That explains to you why, after you've come to church, there will be a jam, not that people are going to the church. They're going now to eat nyama? Choma. That Nairobi, it's only what? 16% of the 6.5 million as projected that go to church, that are committed to the work of Christ. And the other numbers, I don't want to rate them because they're not funny. If I picked only, for example, uh, uh, Nyanza, where I come from, these Jews are only 6% Christians. <laughs> Can you imagine? Central, 7%. Se- the entire Rift Valley and Central, 7%. Committed Christians. But you know there are churches in those places, isn't it? So this was a very depressing statistics. And that then brings us then to the place of looking at this open doors. Beautiful scripture that has been read to us this morning. Now, the, the, when you read from right, right from verse number one all the way to 18, you begin to pick certain themes. And I'll just very quickly take us through the theme of giving. Because there is no gospel without what? Giving. And this is this, every gospel that is preached whichever part of the nation, somebody has given. And so when you read in, in verse number two, Paul is advocating for a very interesting uh, principle there. He's advocating for giving in proportion with your resources. Because you can say when you do our numbers out of one million, each one of us should be able to give 5,000. But that pocket change for somebody. So Paul is saying, Kama una mingi peana? 
That's what he's saying. Luke chapter number 8, verse 1 to 3, you come across women that were supporting the work of Jesus Christ. This miracle worker could not mean to money. He gave men an opportunity to do what? To give into his ministry. And the Bible mentions them by name. And then says, and there are other women who gave out of their means to support the work of God. So you know that Jesus had also associates. So giving is a principle that accelerates the gospel. So that you don't disappear from this church because it's time to give. Uh-uh. It is a principle just as asking is a principle. So giving is also what? A principle in the kingdom. But not this, that it mustn't be money. So think those open doors, may God begin to open our eyes to begin to see what is it that perhaps I can do with what God has given me to be able to reach out. So I've mentioned there that there are people who open their homes. Our stratified evangelism, when we go into a city, our strategy is that, for example, when we went to Meru, Meru, we said we want to hit that city. After doing an analysis, there is what we call the pre- preparation stage. Preparation stage, uh, now that tells you my Jew, the preparation <laughs> stage um, sort of enables you to, to plan, and it's about one to two years. So we don't just do it for a month or two. Uh-uh. We go, and for, one, for the two years, we are just working with the body of Christ in Meru. Seeking to know what do you have? There are banks, there are supermarkets, there are schools and colleges, there are how many prisons. We do a quick review and we know when we go into that city, we will be faced with these different platforms. Remember the stratified evangelism. There is a parliament. There must be a governor somewhere. The gospel must go to all these people. So stratified evangelism then enables us to partner with the local church. So we bring the bishops together and the pastors together and we say, in the next two years, we are coming to your city. We want to evangelize the whole city. So not all churches come, but churches come. And you have over 200 churches that then partner for those 10 days. Because the, the, the preparation, the proclamation period is 10 days, where we now go into all those platforms. And then we have the preservation stage, where now we preserve. We preserve. So we brought together 2,500 missionaries. So for every missioner, one missioner from outside the city, there must be two on the ground. That's our policy. And the church receives it. Now, people give by just opening their doors. According to the model, again, you find in the book of Luke. So that we don't go and stay in good hotels, even though we have the capacity. But we ask men and women, they open their homes, including the team leader. So in Meru, I went into a home and I was received. And I was there for 10 days, eating their food, drinking their water, and sleeping in the bed they have given us. Because that is what Jesus advocated in Luke chapter number 7. When you go, those are the men of peace. So you could just be opening your door. Our home is strategically placed just about a 7 to 10 minutes drive to JKIA. My wife cannot tell you the many missionaries that we have hosted. When we just hear wind like this, oh, you, are, you are headed to where? DRC Congo. And you'll be staying how many hours? Or oh, only four hours. In the, come and refresh in our home. Because that ministry, it cannot be without doing what? Giving. They come and they get, and you receive that with Paul almost everywhere you go. So don't, don't be like a small house saying, after all, to kirita, tutakuwa ni mimi na bibi yangu apana. Prepare the home for missionaries. Because they will indeed come into that city. So before I go much into that giving, these people will say, hey, this is a prosperity gospel guy. The other theme that comes in the, that scripture that we've read is association and partnerships. You cannot share the gospel without partnerships. Even for us to go into the city of Meru, where by the grace of God, 17,800 gave their lives to Christ. Now, those are huge numbers. That if we decided we are partnering with, say, Sitam, because Sitam had already stepped in there, they would not absorb them. 
So, but these 200 churches, each one of them received. There are some that had to expand their churches. Sit a man to move from a hotel into a facility because suddenly they have 178 people put to them as their disciples. So you must do what? You partner. We go into prison with prison fellowship. We go into the universities with focus. We go into the primary schools with KSEF. These are partners that we talk with upfront. Biblica, they release every single Bible for those 17,000 people. So partnerships and associations. And we see Paul introducing that because he's talking about Timothy. Those are partners. He's mentioning others like Apollos and Stephanas and many others that come into this partnership. Why? Because without partnership, you cannot preach the gospel. What it does, it brings unity and focus on the mandate given to the body of Christ. But number two, you see the book of Acts is full of partnerships. Partnerships. So I see that when you read that. But another interesting, <laughs> another interesting thing that Paul addresses so much in the, in, the, in the first Corinthians, and you now find that even in the second Corinthians, is motives. The, the, what is the driving force? What makes you share the gospel? Is it the money that you are being paid? What is the driving force that makes you decide that I must go to Tuskis to share the gospel? And he outlines that, that the, the, it has to be out of what? Love. It's out of love. Because he says in Philippians chapter number 1 and verse number 15, some, of, some people preach out of envy and rivalry. But the gospel is being preached anyhow. But it has to be out of what? Out of pure motives. Because the pure motives are able to yield divine results. Which are driven by the focus on God's agenda. And God's agenda is the will of God. And the will of God, as far as I'm concerned, must supersede our plans. As we see how Paul responds to the open doors. Now, before somebody says, I know Jamata Kusoma Taka scripture Kamoja. Let me just read a small portion so that you see how Paul responds to the will of God. This is what Paul says in verse number nine. That's all I will, I will read for today based on the timing. This is what Paul says. Let me start from verse number seven. For I do not want to see you now and make only a passing visit. I hope to spend time with you if the Lord permits. But I will stay on Ephesus until Pentecost because a great door for effective ministry, effective work has opened to me and there are many who oppose me. So he says two things there. He's saying a great door has opened. While I desire to come to you, I would want to make this trip. It's my desire to come to this very church that I planted in Corinth. But I will stay in Ephesus. Why? Because a great door of ministry has opened. And you're saying, wow. Maybe he's planning at the next mega church. Then he quickly puts in a statement there that now becomes very scary. He says, but great many people are doing what? Are opposing me. That is what Jesus says that I am sending you like lambs among the what? The wolves. So you can see a man who already knows that there is great opposition. What is the driving force that is pushing him? It's, it's like you've been told that area kuna mungiki. Lakini unasema nitaka hapo. So there must be something that is beyond just the nice environment that is moving into. So the gospel must be preached out of love. Love for these perishing people. Love for this man that I know. I do not know whether they have another minute. They might as well never be there. But I want to give you a quick understanding of the city of Ephesus. This was a very strategic port city and in the western Asia Minor, which present day is, is Turkey. Now as a port city, it was only ranking, you would only compare it with Alexandria in Egypt. Those are business areas where people would come and interconnect as they are doing businesses. And of course, you also know Antioch uh, of Syria. Now, cities, by their nature, they are, they are 
political basis. There are places where ad administrative uh, positioning happens. That is why we decide who gets what resources. So when Paul is, and, and you see even in the book of Acts, God will tell him that in this city, I have many people. A lot of opposition in the city where he is in, but he's saying, I have many people in this city. So cities are very strategic. And the reason why I'm focusing on city, I know you are going to Lamu, but wait a minute. KCC is positioned in the city of Nairobi. So in other words, you have been positioned in a very, a very, what I would call critical place, a place of influence, a place where you can make decisions that will determine the eternity of many people. And cities are very interesting. In, in the year 2014, United Nations undertook a survey. And the survey indicated that 54% of the world population are found in urban centers. So you are saying if, if the world has 8 billion people, you are saying 4 billion people are found where? In cities, in urban centers. That's where they are. This is UN. Very interested. Where are people going? This migration, where are they going? They are not spread. They are in a city. But it is projected that in, in 2050, that number might go to 66%. And in our own country, Kenya, after the promulgation, now we know that that's a reality. Why? Because people are not now going just to Nairobi. They are going to all these counties. Those are what? Those are cities. Nairobi itself is begging for evangelism. Why? Because the population right now, the World Population Review, projects Nairobi at 6.5 million. Maybe more, I do not know. But it has one of the largest slum. 22% of this population live in abject poverty. This is a man who lives from hand to mouth. But there's an interesting statistic that I came across there. That the, 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 it has a growing class. Where in Nairobi, we have about 35% of that population. These guys who have the capacity to get a loan, they have the, if you go to, to Kitengela, you see now even banks are aligning themselves. There are some of these business hubs that are coming up. It means as the bank is interested in those numbers, then the churches must also be interested. Because there is something about the city. So what are the open doors in these cities? What are the open doors? I am glad and I deliberately put those top three because I was told this church is deliberate in reaching out to prisons. That is a response to the reality in that particular city. Because they are prisons. These are captives. They are ready to be received. In fact, at the throne room of God, we will be asked. I was, but you never. You understand? So this is a place that God has given us. So it is important that as a member of the congregation, you must ask yourself, can I be a partaker of this ministry in prisons? We have schools and colleges. I understand that you have a ministry in the same. Recently, I went into the Kenya Assemblies of God um, General Assembly, and Nancy was there, who, who took over from Reverend. And Nancy was telling us, we have over 3,000, and I want to believe I'm right, 3,000 schools that we've already partnered with and all they are looking for is for even a church to come in and adopt them as their own place. So she was literally begging this assembly and saying, hey, please partner with us. God has opened doors in ministry and ministry. Children homes, thank God that you partake of the same. Again, the same thing that will face us in the day when Jesus will be asking us that I was, but you never. Hospital chaplaincy. Have you ever won a soul to Christ? This is a good place to start from. <clears throat> because hospital chaplaincy, you are basically going at the side of the bed of somebody who is already devastated. God has opened that door for us as a church in Aga Khan, a Muslim hospital, and you know that. Now, who goes to that hospital? It's the one who can afford, isn't it? Or the one that is medically covered. The many times I've gone to that hospital, I've prayed with people that by the time you ask them who you are, you begin trembling because you imagine that perhaps under the bed there's some money. 
Because the title itself tells you that God suddenly has brought to me on this bed a man who was running away. You ask them, have you ever gone to church? They ask you, what is church? And this is a senior engineer of an, a, a multinational company. But suddenly, God has stopped them on their track. They are sick. They are helpless. And all we go there is to pray. Can I pray with you? And they, there is none of the people that have ever said, don't pray for me. And that opens a conversation. And we've led many. Every Wednesday, every week, we, led many, we lead many to the Lord. So the, those are open doors that then the leadership of the church can then have a conversation. Current hospital. How can we be? We just want to pray. Just prayer. So that to, so, uh, psychologically we begin to help in the process of healing. And as you do that, that one, even if you've never led anybody to Christ, you can go and pray. But God has a way of opening a conversation and then you realize each week you are celebrating souls. Bonas if we are Police stations, open doors, gated communities. Gated communities, you don't go into those communities because kunaumbwa. So how do we reach them? Because they must be reached if you go into a city. The model there is what we call, you call them into meetings. Because there is no mbunge, however busy they are. If you call them for dinner, they will come. Chakula, it has something about kujeni mukule na niyabure mutalipa. Even the busiest minister will come. So those are models that use for what? Gated community. But where does it take us? It takes us back to where we began. There must be then a place where we do what? We begin to give. Because in giving, you are able to provide a plate for dinner. Buenas if sana. And one of the models that we've used whenever we go into cities, we simply say we will have a dinner for professionals. We did that in, 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 in Mombasa this year because that's the city we focused in. And we kept on praying, Lord, if you gave us 17,000 in, in, in Meru, give us more. Our target was 20,000. But by the grace of God, we fell short of that. About 19,300 gave their lives to a city that is predominantly what? Islam. But what happened? In these dinners, we say for every table there must be 10 people, but only 2 Christians. So don't come with your family to enjoy this free meal, Apana. Just come and facilitate for us. Every table of 10, there are how many? 2. Now that is possible even for Karen. All the managers of the, the petrol stations that are here, bring them into a dinner. Free. But don't bring in somebody who will be jumpy and preaching the gospel and telling people, turn to your neighbor, tell them Jesus is your partner. <laughs> bring in a man with decorum. A man will come in and say, ladies and gentlemen, mabibi na mabwana, thank you for coming for this dinner. We don't have any agenda. We just wanted you to refresh. We know you are leaders of this city. And we really appreciate the way you, you have brought serenity in the current community. That, that's the speaker. It could be Dr. Muriuki of, of, of Cop Bank. Because he's born again, isn't it? But he's speaking to his peers. And he's basically thanking them. And then he tells his story. I was, but now I am. Because I was blind, but now I see. I am in the marketplace just like you. And then he tells them, I have discovered something. Who leads the leader? Because you are a leader in your category, isn't it? But who leads the leader? Even if he left that question at that level, they will go thinking. Who actually leads the leader? Who leads the president? Who leads the most powerful president in the, in, in the nations of the world? There must be a superior being. So in that dinner, you can begin to focus on this God who leads the leader. But if you knocked at their door, Mbokali will come out. And you'll say, the Lord has released you to suffer. <laughs> but it's the wisdom that you did not, to understand that stratified evangelism, you must understand where are you going. Try that even in the state house. As much as you're filled with the spirit of the Lord, those guys will shoot you. So we begin to see that even gated communities are open doors. But we must see, how do we go into those doors? Friendship evangelism. 
purposing in your heart that for every Sunday I will invite a family. Just come. Ours is structured. Two hours we mean it and we go. Maybe I should look at my watch. Okay? Associations and partnerships. That in the business you become friends to these people with an intention. Let that intention be that one day I will reach out to them. Service and special events like the dinner I've mentioned. Call it a fundraiser, but then say, invite also our unbelieving friends. And as they come, they get an opportunity. Home visits. As we go to visit those homes to pray for the sick amongst ours. Remember that in those homes there are unbelievers. So go there with an intention to preach an evangelistic gospel. All these are open doors. Hospital visits. We go and we surround them with all these goodies and the cards and things are protruding next to the, but we never protrude the gospel. How do you do that at the bedside? Let's say, let us pray. And as you pray, you can evangelize in your prayer. Did you know that? I tried it once in this very hospital close here. And I was asked to pray for a man whom I loved so much. Time will fail me to explain how it went. But as I was praying, and I was, and I was saying, Lord, I know this man is, 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 is desperate. But all of us are desperate. And I could sense even the nurses opening their eyes because they are wondering, I see, see, we are not desperate. <laughs> but the truth is, they are what? They are desperate. But I was speaking a message into their hearts because through that you are able to evangelize. So how do we respond as I do the closure? You must take initiative of having to go as your lifestyle. And going, we are going into all these platforms. Going, going beyond to the ends of the world. You must decide as a Christian based on these numbers. They must unsettle you somehow and say, Lord, how can I go into my banking system? How can I go into my engineering friends? How can I be part of this giving? And must actively participate in, in raising prayer. Let that be part of your prayer as a family that as you pray, that day you pray for those whom you want God to, to bring to the gospel. And then commit to respond sacrificially to financial support. We don't give out of abundance. We give sacrificially, isn't it? And we can say this for many, many, many hours. Then seek to excel in, in kind support. And hopefully maybe in the second service, I'll be able to give an example of a woman whom I know that has thrived in, 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 in kind. Very powerful. Became a blessing to us in Mombasa then take advantage of already open doors. So if you're being told that the Lord has opened for us prison ministry, the Lord has opened for us school ministry, those are doors that are already open, but you need to take advantage of it. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have given us an opportunity to hear your word. However brief it is, Lord, but we believe that when your word goes forth, it becomes alive in the heart of your people. And I pray that in those quiet moments as they think through these words that you've released today, that their hearts will be quickened to respond deliberately to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you that we are among the 72. Nameless, but we can put ourselves right in the thick of the gospel because you have called each one of us. That is not a preserve of the pastors and the bishops, and the apostles, and perhaps the mission departments, but each one of us. Would it be that, Lord, we will be among the many to, to, to just change that statistics, that out of ten, Lord, we can say six 